The story I'm about to tell you is one we first read about last week, but we didn't share it with you then. We hit the pause button and waited because honestly, we thought this can't possibly be true. Too much about the story from the headline to the conclusion felt unbelievable. But as we looked further, the story, upsetting as it was, turned out to be all too true. First, the believable beginning. This 25-year-old Alabama man, Austin Smith Clem, was convicted in September of raping his former neighbor three times, twice when she was 14 and again when she was 18. The jurors deliberated for less than two hours before they rendered a verdict. Testifying for the prosecution was the survivor, her best friend, her father, and a nurse. Clem's defense reportedly did not call any witnesses during the trial. So Clem's conviction wasn't the unbelievable part. It's what happened when he was sentenced last week that made our jaws drop and our stomachs churn. Just going to read the headline from Mother Jones. Alabama man won't serve prison time for raping 14-year-old. I'm going to read that again. Alabama man won't serve prison time for raping 14-year-old. Now, let me remind you that Clem was convicted on three separate counts of sexual assault. But according to the reporting, he will serve no prison time. Read nearly to the end of the story here, and you're going to find this paragraph. Toten, he's the defense attorney in this story. Toten notes that he and Woodruff, he's the judge, are childhood friends who grew up down the street from one another, although Toten says he didn't feel that that affected the sentence. He didn't feel that being childhood friends with the judge affected the sentence rendered. And that sentence from Judge, judge James Woodruff was a total of 40 years in the state penitentiary suspended, along with six years of supervised probation. Essentially, the sentence was structured in such a way that Clem, convicted on three counts of rape, would not serve prison time unless he violates the term of what is essentially an extensive parole. Per the judge's orders, he will serve two years in the LCC P, Limestone County Community Corrections Program, a program whose own website claims to, quote, keep violent offenders incarcerated longer by placing nonviolent, low-level offenders in the community corrections program, diverting them from the penitentiary. So during the time that this convicted rapist will spend in this program for nonviolent offenders, he'll be able to live at home. Mother Jones quotes Clem's defense attorney, Dan Toten, as saying, Clem's lifestyle for the next six years is going to be very controlled. If he goes to a party and they're serving beer, he can't say, can I have one? Toten said this sentence was no slap on the wrist. So by now, I'm sure you're seeing the parts of the story that at first we thought were simply unbelievable. This man was convicted of three counts of rape of a minor, and the primary punishment seems to be about having to stay sober while at a party. The survivor in this story is now a college student, and she's reacting publicly. Here's what she had to say to our affiliate WAFF about the verdict. It's been proven guilty, guilty, however many times guilty, and you're going to put him back in the streets with all of these people. I don't know how that's okay with you. but. In my heart, I feel like jail is where, really where he needs to be because I feel like that's the only place where he's not going to hurt people anymore. That was Courtney Andrews, and normally, you know, we wouldn't name a rape survivor. But Courtney has been quite vocal in the aftermath of this case. And she was in the courtroom for the sentencing, and she recalls the prosecutor leaping up when it was read and saying, this isn't legal. It's not a legal sentence. We reached out to the judge multiple times for a statement regarding the sentence, and despite our repeated attempts, he did, we have not heard back. Now, not only is the county district attorney going to the Alabama Criminal Court of Appeals and arguing that Clem's current sentence is illegal, but a network of rape crisis centers in Alabama are pushing to change state laws so that nothing like this sentencing can ever happen again. Now, I know that so much about this story seems unbelievable, but you do not have to take my word for it because when we come back, Courtney Andrews is here and she's going to speak for herself. We've been talking about the story that left us stunned this week. This young woman, Courtney Andrews, survived being raped three times, twice at the age of 14 and once again at 18. 
by the same assailant, 25-year-old Austin Smith Clem, a one-time neighbor for family in Alabama. And for that, Clem got a sentence on November 13th that has sparked outrage and disbelief. Six years probation and two years in a nonviolent community correction center. And zero real prison time. Courtney is not staying silent. She is making sure that people know about a rape sentence that some are calling illegal, and she is determined to fight this injustice. Joining me now is Courtney Andrews, now a student at the University of South Alabama. Also with her is her aunt, Melanie Johnson, and also Erin Carmone, national reporter for MSNBC.com. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. um, start by telling me when you decided to tell and who you initially told. Um, I was 18 when I told. Um, actually, my best friend um, told for me because I didn't have the heart to tell my parents. So. Um, I, I absolutely understand that. And yet that has also been used against you as a survivor in this mm -hmm. case, as it so often is, that somehow, because you didn't react the way that people who have never survived this think you should have reacted, that that somehow says you were complicit in it. Tell me how you've had to fight back against that. Um... It's just that people don't understand, like, the feelings that come along with it. Um, being scared, the fact that I was young, I was a child. Um, you know, you threatened to hurt my family, you threatened to hurt me. Um, what was I supposed to do? And it's just hard because people aren't going to understand that. Um, and a lot of people that have a problem with it, it's going to be hard to change their attitude towards it. So I feel like there's not really a whole lot that I can do to change their mind. But you're doing a lot right now to try to change the minds of the people who know that this man did this mm -hmm. because he has been convicted of it and yet gave a sentence so light that it is hard to even think of it as a sentence. Right. So you were protecting yourself, protecting your family, protecting your privacy for so many years and now you're here having to reveal such a personal thing. Why did you make that decision to stand up and to have a voice in this moment? I just felt like if it happened with me, then it probably happens with other people. And if no one has really stood up and said anything about it, then maybe no one ever will if I don't. So I felt like it would kind of be an injustice to other people if I didn't. Um, and I just knew I had to do what I had to do. How angry is the family right now? very angry very disappointed um it's just we were floored by it um you know i don't i don't understand it, it really it's an understanding thing how could it happen i mean when, when they read the sentence to us we were like what does that mean what is, and, and we went and we were talking to the people and we we're like what does that mean and when they said no jail time we we're looking at each other going no nah. That you're understanding it wrong. It can't be. That can't be what it can't is. be. And of course, at that point, that's that's when you were the most angry. It's like, mm -hmm. this can't be. But um, you know, and then you walk away, you thinking, what are we going to do? That they can't get away with that. Um, there are, for people who are not survivors, may not understand that there are multiple levels to this. There is the decision to tell, and then there is a decision to go forward with the criminal actions, with court. And the decision to tell and the decision to go forward with criminal actions are very different choices. And often, we don't do the second one because of exactly this. Right. This isn't even, Erin, a case where the survivor is not believed by a jury, which is so often the case, but where a jury believes you, mm -hmm. provides a conviction, and then a judge refuses to sentence and in so doing says this is a nonviolent offense basically. 
Right. I think that the, there are many injustices here, and it, an enormous injustice is the idea that these programs, which are designated for nonviolent offenders like drug offenders who need healing and have not committed violence, that the implicit idea here that rape is not a violent act, when it is obviously a very violent act that is masked by all of our society's issues around the fact that it's also an intimate act. But to think about how extraordinary, first of all, your courage in coming forward that a majority of rape survivors will not report, I believe the number is 54 percent, of those the prosecutor has to decide that there is enough evidence to bring charges. Then if you're able to get a conviction, you know, an analysis by Rain showed that out of the cases that are convictions, 97 out of 100 will not serve a day in prison. So unfortunately this is an extraordinary injustice that is all too common. I, um, we, you know, we believe in alternatives to sentencing on this show. We, in fact, talk about alternatives to sentencing pretty regularly, would support a program like the one that we're talking about here for nonviolent drug offenders for a variety of reasons. But this is clearly not what we are talking about at all. You've said that you feel scared now. You're, this perpetrator, this convicted rapist, is now back in the community, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. And we know, actually, that, that rapists that sexual violence is perpetrated by people who repeatedly do so, both in your condition and, and in, in your case, that's what happened. And so, I, I mean, I applaud you for saying that's exactly, you know, the reason to put yourself through this experience in the justice system is so that it won't happen again. And I, I guess, you know, this is, this is a, a tough one for me. We do conversations here about sexual assault, but um, none has ever hit closer to home for me and um, because my own story is so close to your story because I was the same age because it was a neighbor and um, although I finally told at about 20 never went forward to the court system for exactly this reason and my level of anger that you would have worked up the courage that you did to go forward and for this to happen so what is next um, in the courts is there any possibility of of a new sentence here? Well, um, my attorney, um, Brian, has filled out, you know, paperwork and stuff and um, presented it to the higher court um, to try and get us a new judge to do a new sentencing, um, but there is no guarantee on that. We haven't heard anything right. in yeah. days about it, so we don't know. From, from what I understand, the Alabama statute is written in a very contradictory, confusing way where it both says that this is a, you know, there's this kind of sentencing that should happen and then at the same time that it's eligible for community corrections and it's not. So maybe right. even if they aren't able to fix this particular injustice, people after you will benefit from your activism. Right. What do you need to feel safe? I mean, for him to be in prison, <laughs> I'm not going to feel safe other than that, you know, every time that I think about going home to see my parents. It's going to be um, really hard every time I even think about my parents being home. You know, it just really bothers me and it scares me because they're there and I know I'm only 20, but I want to protect them. Because mm -hmm. you didn't tell because you wanted to protect them. The yeah. I wanted to be strong for my family. I still want to be strong. And if that meant dealing with it on my own, that's what I felt like I needed to do. Thank you for... Um, Thank you for telling. Thank you for pursuing it. Thank you for being here now. Um, it is, it's okay for it to keep feeling bad and um, to give yourself, there's no timeline. It's okay to take the time you need to heal, okay? And we're gonna keep watching this story, all right? And we believe you. Thank you. Courtney Andrews, Melanie Johnson, and Erin Carmone, thank you so much. We're gonna be right back.